More and more, many of us are waking up to the medicinal nature of mushrooms and the potential they can have on our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. Which is why it was an absolute privilege this week to speak to Graham Upson, who's one of WA's leading, probably the leading mushroom expert here in the state. Graham has over 45 years of experience and he, and he tells us of how he's ground that out over years, developing a business that supplied gourmet mushrooms and now how he's moved into the medicinal mushroom field. On top of that, Graham goes, gives you an idea of just how complex and how precise it is to produce mushrooms on a, on a commercial scale. But then also he deep dives into some of the medicinal natures of some of the most well-known mushrooms that you may have heard of ranging from lion's mane, turkey tail, cordyceps, janga, and a few others. This is a fascinating, fascinating conversation. And, and the more you dive into it, the more we, you begin to realize that there's so much more to explore. And that again, we're only at the top of knowing more about this fascinating, fascinating food. So I'm sure you're gonna enjoy this. Graham's a super, super articulate and lovable guy. So enjoy, Graham. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Today I have the great pleasure of talking to Graham Upson. Graham, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much for making time in your busy day to host me here in your mm. factory. Mm. Is it a factory or a farm or? A Mushroom farm generally called. Mushroom yeah. farm. <clears throat> we, we call it the facility. The facility. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to um, talk about medicinal mushrooms. And, and particularly your business here at Touchwood down here in Denmark. Um, so I understand that previously you had a, uh, a gourmet mushroom business closer up to Perth, and then you've spent some time in the wine industry between that, but you've come back to mushrooms. Is that correct? Uh, yes, so I never really left mushrooms. You never really left Um we, we basically built a farm in Perth. Well, there's no one growing mushrooms in Western Australia. When yeah. we first started, there was a couple of guys playing. Yeah. And uh, my wife and I were living in uh, Triggs Island at the time. Yep. Up in Perth. <clears throat> Just got married. And um, we were looking for something rather. I was a photographer. Right. I was a commercial <laughs> photographer. So there's no farming or growing background. Uh, it goes back to my father who was on the land. Yep. In the UK, because I came over when I was nine years old from Essex. Yep. Uh, and Suffolk and Norfolk, that was sort of our area and uh, came over when I was nine years old and uh, lobbed into Australia and mum and dad really didn't know where they wanted to live. I went mm. back several times, that sort of syndrome, which is oh, the yo -yo. quite common, yeah. My brother and I knew where we wanted to be, we wanted to be here. Yes. Um, but they couldn't make their mind up, so we went back uh, several times, but uh, then my brother and I met our two Australian wives on the ship going back on the last time and that was it. was it. We threw the anchors out and said, no, we want to go back to Australia with their parents, basically. Yes. <laughs> and so we ended up in Australia and stayed, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so we, we got married uh, in 74. Yeah. And then um, uh, I was a photographer. I was a commercial photographer. I used to grow, uh, not grow, but take pictures uh, of, I did fashion photography for two and a half years. Right. I did tabletop photography, uh, industrial photography. Um, I used to do all the all the magazines, uh, and I worked for an advertising agency, Ogilvy and Mather, which is a, a major worldwide organisation. Yeah. I was their only photographer, in-house photographer uh, of all their offices in the world, right. in Perth. Okay. So that was rather special. Um, and then uh, went back to England for a while, 16 months, and spent uh, uh, a bit of time in the North Sea as an a, a underwater photographer on the rigs. Right. So basically it was my job to go down and see if there's any uh, issues with the rigs, cracks and whatever, along with a lot of other Navy divers. And they would come down and say, you know, we've spotted cracks on leg B29 or whatever it is because okay. there's motion sensors on the rig and if, there's, if it's moving too much in one way or direction or the other, yeah. they know there's a problem. Yeah. So it's my job to go and photograph the issues and then depending on the strength of, uh, of the photographs, whether they would send down the underwater welders or they would abandon the rig or whatever they would do. Yeah. So that was my job for a while. That wow. was cold, um, cold dangerous, dangerous. And, and, and basically no visibility. It was pretty ordinary. 
uh, but exciting. Yes. Just an aspect of my photography, and I used to do the uh, uh, underwater photography and also the ultrasonic, mm. ultrasonics as well on the on the on the work as well. But so I did that for a short while, and then came back to Australia and uh, got married, um, and then looking for something rather different than photography. We were up in the hills in Kalamunda. Yes. Came across this retired wheat farmer who was growing a couple of mushrooms in his back shed. Uh, you know, he wasn't doing a particularly good job of it because he knew nothing about it, mm. as, as no one knew anything about it. No one in WA, even the Ag Department. I went to the Ag Department and said, I want to grow mushrooms. They said, well, cows, you know, wheat, sheep, pigs, so we can give you a hand with mushrooms. Have no idea. Yeah. Go to France. They grow mushrooms in the caves in France, don't they? I said, oh, I, yeah, I know they do, but That's I'm not hunt. going to France. All right? Yeah. So um, we didn't buy his property. We ended up buying um, 10 acres down at uh, Baldavis, Casarina, south of Perth. Mm. And we put up a trial growing room. And it was, you know, the old, in the old fashioned terms, 20 foot by 20 foot. Just a little growing room. Yep. We built with secondhand bricks because we think, you know, we, this is maybe not going to work. We don't spend too much money on it. Mm. So we put up a trial growing room and we had no idea what we were doing. Had no idea about composting. Clones, spawn, <laughs> soils, pHs, had no idea. Yeah. But this guy up in the hills said, if you can grow these damn things, he says, you'll make a fortune. He says, I can sell everything I can grow. Well, that was probably not too hard because you know, he had a mushroom over there and one over there and one over there. You know, he wasn't doing a particularly good job of it. Right. Um, but he was hooked. But he was 85 then, this old guy. And... So we ended up putting up this trial growing room and, we, you know, we grew sort of 10 kilos and then took them to the shop and the shop said, well, you got, you got any more, you know? Uh, yeah, in three months time, you know, and we put another crop through. And then we ended up sort of had 40 boxes yep. of mushrooms and took it to the local wholesaler just down the road from us, Summerchers, he's called. Yeah. And uh, he said, um, Oh, we don't sell mushrooms, no. But I'll take them into the markets for you in the morning, see how we go. Well, it was six o'clock the next morning, he rang me up. He said, you got any more of those? He said, they flew out. <laughs> I said, no, not for, you know, not for weeks. Yeah. Um, so I said, um, oh, they went well, do they? He said, yeah, absolutely. He says, you know, if you can grow those, he says, you'll do well. That's the second time I've heard this. Starting to get the feedback. <laughs> I'm starting to get some feedback here. And he said, um, well, um, as many as you can grow, I reckon we can sell. So, cut a long story short there, we spent six years playing with mushrooms. Right. Very successfully losing a lot of money. Right. Uh, because we had no idea what we were doing. We were buying materials in that weren't suitable. Um, there was growers over east who were growing mushrooms, but their materials were so different to ours that they couldn't help us. Yeah. So it was really like you've got to learn the hard way. This is the hard way to become a, a mushroom grower, a mycologist, you know. Mycologist, yeah. Really hard way. Um, so after six years, we were growing, you know, like 200 kilos a week. Right. And, and, um, and then we decided, well, we're feeling a bit more confident about this. We'll put up a couple more growing rooms. It must have been a tough six years. It was ordinary. Very ordinary, because it was physically hard work too. Yeah. Because there was no forklifts. There's no lifting equipment. Everything was manual. The turning of the compost was with a pitchfork. Yeah. You know, turn a bit, mix a bit, shovel a bit, water it, come back, do it again. And you know, you're doing 10 tons of compost at a time, having to be turned every other day. <clears throat> you get pretty fit. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, <laughs> it, 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 I thought there's got to be a better way of doing this so you know we ended up laying some more concrete and getting a lifting machine of some sort rather than the wheelbarrow <laughs> and and um, and then we put up a couple more growing rooms which were about 10 meters by five meters put up two more of those and then we you know we got up to 300 400 500 kilos a week wow um, and then we put up another three growing rooms uh, about a uh, year nine you might say we're growing a ton a week. Then we put up three more growing rooms and growing sort of around about two tons a week. And then we plateaued. All selling. 
Oh, we're selling. Oh, absolutely. I've never had an unsold box of mushrooms in my life. Right. Never, no. ever. Um, so basically, we got to that stage and we plateaued for a while because then we got serious about environmental control. We've got air conditions and humidity control, which you need all that if you're going to start growing high yielding crops. You know, yeah. you can't just put your finger in the air and say, I think it's right today. We'll leave the door open for a bit of ventilation. You know, <laughs> yes. it doesn't work that way. Not with mushrooms. Mm. So we ended up buying some air conditioners and, and put those on. This was all costing a lot of money. Um, but then we were up a couple of tonne a week. And uh, we were getting really good prices for the mushrooms. The, pro the profit margin was high Yeah. in the end when we got established. But then we bit the bullet and said, and I was an AMGA director for five years, Australian Mushroom Growers Association. I was on the board for five years. Yeah. And when I used to go to the meetings, they said that um, the new systems coming out in Holland are the Dutch shelf system, which is fully automated, totally computerized, where the compost gets winched in on nets and back out on nets, push button. Uh, everything gets sterilized in bulk, not in trays. Yeah. And um, we bit the bullet and put in a turnkey project from Holland. Right. Millions of dollars worth. And we put that in and um, very hard to get to know how to use this sophisticated equipment because when you're just push button, pushing buttons to in control the environment, um, you've really got to know what you're looking for. Yeah. So our farm was run by the Dutch for a while via the internet. They were in control of our computers for the first wow. six weeks and they were controlling our environment and uh, working on my feedback of what was happening as well because it's always the growers feel yeah. not just the computers hmm. nothing replaces yeah the growers footsteps in the growing room I bet. nothing um, and now I'm pulling on now years of experience of mushroom growing so here we are with this most high-tech mushroom farm in Australia if not the world yep um, and we got up to 20 tons of mushrooms a week good luck 76 staff um, basically picking sometimes halfway through the night picking mushrooms sending mushrooms to Singapore uh, Tokyo um, Borneo we used to supply the um, the uh, what do you call it the, the Shah or the yes of, of Borneo yeah he would order 40 cases of mushrooms a week and that was flown directly up to him every Thursday afternoon good lord yeah that was his order yeah. Um, so we... And these, what type of mushrooms are you growing at this point? Oh, uh, we're just growing the uh, Agaricus bisporus, which is the button mushroom. Yeah. And... Um, which most people would know. As the ordinary to... mushroom you see in Coles and Woolworths, whatever. Yep. Um, more or less, um, Cremini's, uh, Swiss browns, <coughs> portobellos, and the big f field mushrooms. Mm. So we were, had a range of mushrooms at that stage, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, it was exciting, a really exciting part of our life because we were thumping along. Yeah. And we had a, a, virtual, a virtual monopoly. There's a couple other farms started up after that, you know, but not growing as much as us. We were putting down like sort of nearly 800 square meters of area a week of growing area. Wow. Which is a lot of compost. We were making 150 tons of compost a week. Good Lord. And we had these massive composting machines, which were, you know, like seven, eight meters long and two meters, three meters wide. And, um, and which we built ourselves uh, because we couldn't bring these in from America. They were just too expensive. They were like yeah. six, three to four to five hundred thousand dollars a machine. Wow. So we had it built locally and we built our own machine. And this is a brute of a machine, a big mm. drum on the front. We used to pick the compost up and throw it out the back and mix it up and water it as it goes huge machine like 18 tons this machine anyway so we we had 150 tons of compost coming off the compost yard every week <clears throat> which is where the science is um, if your compost is not right yep you won't grow mushrooms it doesn't matter how good your grower is or how good your growing rooms are or how tight your environmental control is if your compost is not right your substrate is not right no different to what we're doing now you won't grow mushrooms. Right. 
It's all about the chemistry of the compost. So what are the key things that, that go on in the compost? You've got to get your nitrogens right, your moisture levels right, your protein and carbohydrates levels right. But you've got to know and understand how all this changes and moves, all the numbers move during composting. Right. And they do, from wetting down the straw to start with, because the basic ingredients of compost is wheat straw. So we take the stubble, the, the farmers take the heads off the wheat. Yep. We just want the stubble that's left, because <clears throat> it's got some structure to it, some and we, we want the lignin yes. coating on the straw. That's the food for the mushroom. Right. So we take the stubble or the straw, we'll take the chicken manure. We just about took all of Western Australia's chicken manure weekly. We had all the chicken farms sewn up. Uh, because we were going through 60 to 80 cubic metres a week. Wow. A lot of chicken dung, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then gypsum. Um, we used to take all the brewer's grains from the Swan Brewery, all the leftovers from the brewing process. We used yeah. to take, take all that as well. Couldn't get enough of that. And um, in the early days, we used to... Were all to these businesses quite grateful that you were taking their excess stuff away? <clears throat> Yeah, well, some of them we were doing a real service. Um, I yeah. mean, the straw was, uh, for the farmers, was either burnt and just let to go back in the ground as a, as a potash type thing. Yeah. Or, or they'll just plough it back in. Uh, chicken manure, they had issues hmm. with the environmental side of things, with the fly build up uh, uh, and issues like that. So we would take it and use it. So we would compost it and that was the end of that. It was, wasn't a problem after that. Yes. And then gypsum was straight out the ground, a natural product. Mm. Um, brewers' grains, well, that was an issue. What did they do with that? Yeah, that was dumping it, um, creating, creating another fly problem. And it smells too, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we were efficient industry. Um, yeah. But the, the other thing is that once we empty the grime rooms, and we, you know, we'd have hundreds of cubic metres of compost coming out the grime rooms each week. Yeah. Um, it's the best thing for the garden. Yeah. So we, we take products that are an issue, we compost it, we grow a food to feed people, and then yeah. we've got a product that goes back into the ground to grow more things. Totally efficient industry. Yeah. Um, and uh, nothing's changed here. So um, that's exciting. That part of it is exciting. Yeah. Um, we always had so many phone calls to make, to say, look, yes, your compost is ready. It was huge demand for the compost. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, we were in the mushroom game up there for 20 years. Right. So we basically started in 76 and sold 20 years later. Um, we weren't looking for a buyer, but um, we got a phone call one day from um, the heads of Melbourne Mushrooms in Melbourne who basically is Campbell Soups yep. of America. And they said, do you mind if we come over to um, have a chat? I said, well, if you want, yeah, come over if you want. Yeah, I don't care. Sunday afternoon, thank you very much. They don't care what day it is. They came over and said, um, we're thinking of getting into mushrooms in Western Australia. And we want to know if you want to sell your mushroom farm. I said, well, depends on a few things, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they were pretty heavy handed about it in as much as more or less what they said, if you don't sell to us, we'll start next door. So in other words, if you don't sell to us, we'll put you out of business. Yeah. So I thought to myself, there's an idle threat because there's no one in the world that's going to catch up with the knowledge I've got yeah. in, a, in a rush. Yes. So we said, um, well, you can go back to Melbourne if you want, you know, thank you very much. Thanks for the offer. We're not interested. Reasonably risky thing to do at the end of the day, because you know you don't know what their resources are. Yes. But their attitude was wrong. So off you go. Uh, but only a few weeks later they rang up again. But this was not the American side of the operations. It was the two Australians that came over, who were yeah. managing the mushroom farm side of it. Yeah. And they're much more easy to get on with. Let me tell you. Yes. <laughs> and they said, uh, "Now look, we've we've done our homework." Um, yeah. We don't want to do a greenfields project. We don't want to start building a mushroom farm, yep. getting all the approvals for all the composting because you have to have all sorts of licenses to make composts and you've got to make sure you've got heaps of water. Yep. Then you've got to 
sort out the marketing, then you've got to sort out the staff, then you've got to buy all the gear in, then you've got to know what to do. Yeah. Too hard. Oh, I knew that. Yeah, that's what I told you to clear off. I knew that, yeah. <laughs> that's reasonably confident to tell you to clear off, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, we negotiated uh, for all oh, 11 months and, and we, we were put through the ringer in regards to the environmental side of it because the, the Americans are, are really worried about the atmosphere and, and the environment. Mm. So we dug 14 holes around the farm to quite a depth, checking out if we had any pollution on the site because the runoff juice from the yeah. compost is very rich in salts and things like this. <clears throat> and if you upset the water table, well, you're, up, you're in trouble with the EPA for a start and then that can go anywhere. Yeah. Anyway, we checked it all out and we had no issues. You know, we'd done it properly. Um, and the deal went through. So, more or less, uh, that was the end of mushrooms for us. And we, were, had a, we had a clause saying that we couldn't start another mushroom farm up for four years because, you know, I could be a major threat. Yeah. So, well, that's fine. I've tried to just sold a mushroom farm. I don't want to start another one just yet. Yeah. But within uh, only a year and a half or so, they sold half their operation to another company. So they were in cahoots with another company, which basically my, my agreement not to start up again I was null and void. So meantime, we come down here and put a vineyard in because I was very interested in the winemaking hmm. side of things. Again, agriculture fascinated me. So we put in 25 acres of vines here, really my focus was Pinot Noir and Champagne production, or sparkling, I'm supposed to call it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, but it was only a couple of years after putting that in that we decided to put this big complex in here yeah. to grow more button mushrooms. Because everybody was on my case down here and saying, Graham, we know who you are. Yeah. You know, we used to get your mushrooms from Perth, but you're down here now. Why can't you grow them down here for us? And I weakened and I put in a small mushroom farm just doing a couple of tonne a week uh, with my brother. And because um, he was looking for something to do too. And, uh, and so we got into this and um, we were more or less growing organically, which is not easy to do. Yeah. In fact, quite hard to do with mushrooms. Yeah. Because there is a few, few chemicals involved with growing buttons and fields and portobellos, mm. which I was not at all happy with. And there's one reason I like to get out. There's a lot of chemicals involved. Hmm. Um, but we were growing down here with very few chemicals, which was lovely. Yeah. But the yields are lower, diseases are higher. You're fighting off, you're really fighting the elements. Anyway, we were growing a few tons of mushrooms a year a week and still with the vineyard going. Um, and then I started to make my own wines. I self-taught myself as a, as a winemaker. Um, and um, uh, it did pretty well. Did pretty well. We got uh, in Copenhagen, our Pinot was entered um, in the World Pinot Taste Off, and only 161 Pinots were allowed to enter. This is like invite only. And we got the nod from as only two Australian producers of Pinot were allowed to enter. And, ours, nice. and our Pinot went in because we'd won the Sheraton Wine Awards Best Pinot in Australia and New Zealand, and, and Royal Perth Show and the Royal Melbourne Show. We'd done a lot of good things yeah. with Pinot. And I was pretty happy with it. And we came out number one Pinot in the world. So that was a pretty good day too. Um, so we, we won that. And, um, and then my other love was champagne production. This is me making my own wines here at this stage. Yep. And um, uh, the, the champagnes basically were been sitting in the top five champagnes in Australia for the last six years. And there's some world-class champagnes particularly coming out the cool climate areas of Tasmania and, yes. uh, and the cooler climate areas. And this is a cool climate area down here, just beautifully suited for champagne production. So our bubbles are now all seven years on the lees and absolutely stunning. Um, and we were exporting to Copenhagen and Russia and Poland and London and China. We were doing quite a bit of export with um, wines too. Uh, our agent in London, I don't know if you want to talk about wines. Are you talking about wines? Do you want to talk about mushrooms? Mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get off the course. Um, just one more thing. Yeah. I was, um, our agent in London um, was Berry Brothers and Rudd. Right. 
which is a very old company, formed yes. in 1698. Yes. And they got the royal warrant for the British royal family. Mm. And that was our agent in London. So lovely. we had some lovely company, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to mushrooms. Yeah. Because mushrooms are my first love. You know, the wine came along for the ride. There's a real sense that um, you like to tinker and, 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 and learn and master. And I'm a process know, person. Process person. I like to have an idea and I really like something that not many people have been doing yep. because I want to nut it from beginning to end. Right. And that's me, is just get into it and just, uh, and I come out the other side knowing a lot more than most others. You enjoy I've, learning stuff. Yeah, because I've made all the mistakes and I reckon making mistakes is the best way of learning, of course. Because mm. you think, oh gee, I'm not doing that again, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that was costly. And that, and that you can do 10 times a day at a mushroom farm, let me tell you. Right. <laughs> So um, basically, um, yeah, we, we um, my focus is, uh, I've always known about medicinal mushrooms. Mm. I was going to ask, how did we yeah. get from well, okay, well, um, one to the other? I mean, basically, I spent my early life with, with pixie mushrooms, as we were called, filling people's bellies with mushrooms, you know, just pushing out tons of mushrooms. Yeah. And then when we sold that, got into this, got into wine, the medicinal side kept them coming up and I've read about it for years and, and done a lot of study on it. Yeah. But never been in that position to say, let's do medicinals. Um, until I realised that, you know, th there's more to just filling people's bellies. It's about pay making people um, live longer, feel better, um, help them out, anybody with particular chronic issues. And the more I read, I realised mushrooms had a part to play. Yeah organically as well um but you need to go about it properly yes because there's no good just you know, chomping on a mushroom that's just not good enough there's ways you need there's ways you need to process mushrooms to get the compounds out to make you uh, make them worthwhile yes so we put up we stopped growing the button mushrooms here and then put in a class 100 laboratory yeah which is a fully filtered unit at, at three microns you, you didn't have one of those in the previous place no we got our spawn made by a company in the eastern states mm. who basically is a, is a company that's worldwide who makes spawn for just about everybody mm. sylvan uh, and they do a great job and uh, so but here because it's so specialized you need to be able to make your own spawn mm. so there's a very technical job uh, it's very precise yeah so a class 100 laboratory is the least you need to make sure you've got the airs filtered properly. Yeah. And before you go in, you're dressed up, you know, you've got the suit on, you've got the hat on, you've got the gloves on, you've got the mask on, you're sprayed down with alcohol. And it's the first job of the day. Yeah. You don't enter the mushroom farm. You go yeah. straight into the laboratory. Um, and once you're in there, you don't come out, uh, uh, you can't go back in again. You yeah. know, you've got to do the whole job. So make yeah. sure everything's in there for you to do. Yeah. So we do our own cloning of mushrooms. We can take mushrooms from the wild and bring them into the lab and then take a sample of it and clone it onto a Petri dish right. and grow it out onto a Petri dish. And then from that, we can grow it into grain and make spawn. Yep. And then we can grow the crop again under controlled conditions. And this mushroom might have come from just the forest, just outside. Yeah. So we can grow a turkey tail or a reishi or a lion's mane or whatever we find or mushrooms that no one's ever heard of before Yeah. and bring it into the lab and say, well, we don't know what this mushroom's about. Yeah. But it might be the cure for cancer. Yep. So this is where you get excited. Yeah. Because there is over 2 million mushrooms out there currently. I've heard up to 3.8 million, of which only 2,000 really have been identified. Yes. There's a long way to go. Yes. And, and that's to me, is the exciting bit. And the and reason we are down here, apart from the fact it was a good place for wine, is that Denmark has one of the best environments for naturally growing mushrooms than I think anywhere in Australia. Right. There's varieties around here. This is such a natural growing room, you might say, this region. Yeah. That uh, this is where I wanted to plonk myself just to say, here, I can walk out and grab any sort of mushroom uh, and lots of different types and bring me into the lab. So I'd mm. like to get in more into that science side of it there yes. and start bringing out mushrooms um, that maybe uh, no one's ever seen before, tested before, 
from micronutrients. We've supplied mushrooms to um, Queen Elizabeth II, QE2 in Perth. I work with uh, the, the head of cancer biology in there. Um, also, our mushrooms are going on from there to the University of Hong Kong right. for cancer research. These are the medicinal ones you're doing Medici now. Yeah, medicinals we're doing now. Uh, cancer research um, for dementia, Parkinson's, yeah. Alzheimer's, um, fatigue, all sorts of things, diabetes, leukemia, all these sorts of things are being tested for. Um, I'm about to start working with the, um, uh, a chemical analyst uh, person at Curtin Uni. Yep. Um, because we're now getting our mushrooms now getting so finely tuned that we want to know not only what compounds are in our mushrooms, but what the levels of compounds are in the mushrooms. Right. Because we're getting to know now how many compounds we need, what compounds we need, and what levels, what dosage. Yes. Now, there's a lot of people doing uh, mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms in Australia, and not supplying enough information, as I'm concerned, about what's, what's actually in the in product. The mushroom, yeah. Because if you just grab a fruit body of a mushroom, whether it be a lion's mane, reishi, turkey tail, whatever it might be, um, freeze dry it, and then powder it. You, you've got the powder. That's going to do you some good, of course, because it's a mushroom. Yeah. Absolutely. But the, the real compounds we're looking for are locked in the cell wall of the mushroom. And the cell wall of the mushroom is a chitinous type material. Right. It's very hard, and it doesn't break down unless you apply heat. And in most cases, we do a hot water test. Yeah. And then we would extract some of the compounds with alcohol. So the compounds that are released in the water are obviously the water-soluble compounds. Yes. And then the ones in the alcohol are the non-water uh, soluble compounds. And, yeah. and we're looking for all of those. And as there is products on the market that are, are not doing that. Right. Right. So you've got to know what you're buying and you need to question the supplier. Is, is, is he extracting the compounds that are necessary for good health? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is just literally consuming it is not enough. It's not enough. No, you think, you, you think you're right because you're eating a mushroom. Yes. Well, you're, you're halfway there. Yeah. But if you want, you want the real benefits, you're looking for all the triterpenes and the acids that come out yeah. during the extraction processes. And if they're not there, yeah. um, you're only getting half the story. Yes, because okay. your body's not able to extract them. The, the body will not break down the chitinous walls of the mushroom going through the digestive system. Um, but if you make them available from the first mouthful, because we can processes that can do that, um, totally organic processes, you're going to be better off, absolutely better off. Yeah. yeah. So other ways to consume mushrooms are through how then? Well, obviously powders is, yep. is a popular way, a uh, convenient way. Um, so that's where it has been broken down. And that's it where, it, yeah, we would do all the processes. So the powders, in our case, have got all those processes done. So those valuable compounds are available in the powders. Yep. All right. Um, and then you've got tinctures. Yep. Tinctures, where, which is another, uh, can be a heat process in the yep. case of a tincture, and also um, an alcohol extraction. Um, and then again, that's breaking down those cell walls of the mushroom yes. or the herb or whatever you're going to do, right? You need to know what that particular product needs to be done to it. Yes. It might only be a hot water or it might only be an alcohol yeah. or it might need dual extraction. You might need both, you know? Um, so you need to know, you need to talk to your herbalist yep. or your mushroom person, right? Your mycologist to yep. find out what's required. Um, but going back again is, what I'm saying is that our products will be supplied with a sheet from a laboratory saying these compounds are available because we've done it properly. Yeah. And without that, I'm not sure whether you're getting the benefit. Well, I know damn well you're not getting the benefit. Yeah. Yeah. So you either do it properly or you don't. What is it about mushrooms that, I mean, look, I, <sighs> What I'm about to say is, is, is so blatantly obvious, but it, it, it misses a lot of people, which is that many of the, um, the molecular structures that form the basis of our chemical allopathic drugs and medicines are often re 
a replica of what is naturally occurring in the plant kingdom. Yet, and, 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 and we seem to forget that, yet when we consume like a herb from, from, from the plant kingdom, it, it doesn't just come with one molecular structure, it comes with a whole number of others with it. Um, but what is it about mushrooms? Because there seems to be a bit of a rise in the focus, well, certainly for me, um, in the focus of the medicinal nature of mushrooms. What is it about mushrooms that makes them so packed full of this stuff? Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it basically, if you're, uh, if you look at a green plant or a mushroom, yeah, um, particularly in the mushroom, is growing. In the case of medicinal, they mainly grow on decaying wood, <coughs> so they're in a forest, right? Yeah. And be, and they were not growing a tree that's just fallen, right? Yeah. It's got to be fallen. It's got to be felled for years. Yes. That wood is breaking down itself. Then all of a sudden, the spore comes along and then lands on that piece of wood, and all of a sudden, you've got this bracket fungus growing. Yes. Could be a turkey tail. It could be anything. Yes. Rishi. Could be a you know. It could be a heronaceous um, lion's mane. Mm. So basically, um, that mushroom now decided that that wood is habitable for that yeah. mushroom. And that spore won't grow unless it's, everything's right. Yes. So they're quite particular. Oh, yes. Yeah. They, will not, they won't land on the sand and grow, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and there's spores in the air everywhere, you know, to thousands of feet in the air. They're just traveling the world, these spores. They're just moving around, continent and continent. Wow. And and uh, you're breathing in spores, as you, particularly now you're in a mushroom farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so basically, what they're doing, they're very efficient at extracting those micronutrients out that decaying wood. Right. And all different types of wood, in different types of environments and rainfalls, and and in you know countries. Mm. So what they're doing is they're pulling out nutrients in such an efficient way that I don't think we've actually considered that we could do that without the mushroom. The mushroom are more efficient at doing that than anything in science has been able to replicate. So this, right, this is fascinating that you've just mentioned this because for whatever reason, I have been cogitating at times about our relationship with food and how you know, if you break it down, what all we're trying to do is, is, is give ourselves the, the the nutrients and and things that we need for the body to function and certainly certainly you know considering the plant kingdom it seems to be one of sharing and there is there is all these nutrients going backwards and forwards between trees plants mushrooms etc 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 and it just strikes me that the that we could do this better as humans does that make sense is that what you're saying in terms of we have a lot to learn from the mushrooms in terms of a lot to learn yes absolutely a lot to learn mushrooms are incredibly efficient at what they do um and we are we've got to stop with basically i think with the crops that we eat these days we're eating rapidly grown plants mm. and pushed through production levels yes because the, the dollar is important to survive yeah as, as you witnessed previous. Uh, yeah. So mushrooms, in our case, we grow them naturally at their own pace. And mushrooms have got their own time frame anyway. They'll just, they'll just grow at their own pace. Mm. Um, There's no spray in them to bring them on quicker? or Nothing. This yeah. is totally organic here. All our materials are just derived from the raw materials from forests. Our wood base, what we use here, is from the old growth Jarra forests. Hmm. There's no sprays out there. Yeah. Um, and there's no chemicals at, at all in any one of our processes here to grow our mushrooms. Right. So pesticide free. Um, um, so basically the hygiene we keep in the rooms um, is not that high because we don't want to go in there and spray things for flies and bugs. No. So there's one of the reasons that I grow one flush on all our crops because if you keep crops in for more than one flush, disease builds up. Yeah. Whether it be molds, you know, competitive molds like trichoderma or the fly levels would come up. Um, so we're, we're, quite, we're quite happy to work with one flush and get the crop off. Yeah. And then ditch that 
and then come in with a brand new crop and keep the hygiene levels right up there. Mm. And now a lot of people uh, in commercial mushroom growing, you know, we're going three flushes. But yeah. in, in button mushrooms, you've got totally filtered air and a few chemicals being involved. Mm. Even in the material, not just in the air or the floors, but it was in the air as well. Yeah. But also in the material, in the casing tool, there's things put in there to stop fly production. Yeah. Okay, so not everybody knows about that, but um, it's just standard practice. Yes. Because you would not get away with it. And also the shelf life of button mushrooms yeah. would be, um, you know, various shops would, wouldn't be happy with getting two days out of a mushroom when they want four. Yeah. Um, one of the good reasons I got out of it, yeah. Yeah. But here, here we're working naturally, um, working with the clones of mushrooms that we've selected, um, which is... You know, we can do that with our lab here. Um, and there's various mushrooms we can't grow in Australia. Yep. Uh, two reasons, climatic conditions, and the other one is the fact that we're not allowed to bring them in. Yep. That's the, that's the spawn or, the, or a culture. Yeah. One is chaga. Yeah. Chaga grows off the birch tree in the very cool climates of, you know, Siberia, Mongolia, the Yukon, and the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. So it's basically a growth that's on the side of a tree, like a burl, mm. um, a very dark powder. And uh, we get that from northern, like Mongolia, yep. from an organic source, of course. Well, it's basically organic up there anyway, because it's growing in the forest. Yep. And we get that, and that's all treated. Yep. Um, uh, that's extracted, so we get the right compounds. And the other one is cordyceps. Yes. Cordyceps is, is your mushroom that is uh, one of the weirdest mushrooms out. Why is that? Uh, I mean, I don't know if you know how a cordyceps grows in the wild, but basically, again, the spores are floating around, and the cordyceps come from like 4,000 metres up in cool climate areas, mountainous regions of Tibet and places like that, and in China and places that are very cold. Um, and the spore of a cordyceps is it will land on a dead insect, grow on the medium of the internal parts of the insect and then grow out the eyes or the brain of an insect and come up as a right. mushroom. So it's a, it basically it, it separately grows on this little mushroom. And they're a long skinny little orange thing, um, jam packed with goodness. So if you wanted to grow that, you'd have to have a load of dead insects. No, uh, we've got a bit smarter than that. <laughs> yeah. uh, apart from the fact we can't bring that clone in to Australia at the moment. That's just... It's just biosecurity. We're not allowed to do it, which is a bit nonsense, really. Yep. Uh, but we won't go there. Yep. Um, so if you're trying to get mushrooms from the wild, cordyceps from the wild, you're going to be paying something in the region of $60,000 a kilo for them. Because, you know, they're just one there... One over there, might be another one over there, an acre or so over that way. Hand-picked. Yeah. $60,000 a kilo. Right. One of the most expensive growing things ever sold on the planet. Much, right. much more expensive than truffles, of course. Yes. Um, so, obviously, we can't do that. We can't go and gather up or kill loads of insects to grow cordyceps mushrooms. Yeah. So, in the States, they've developed, and in China, they've developed a method of growing them on rice. Right a carbohydrate source, other sources, and we put other things in. Mm. And you can grow them uh, in, in an intensive situation in jars, and they right. grow up in jars on this base subject. And um, we'd love to do it, and we're waiting to do it. And I can do it. I've got the lab, I can do anything. Yeah. Um, but we're not allowed to at the moment. So we bring that in also from a organic trusted supplier that we know, and you know, I've been in the mushroom game for 45 years I know who to deal with yes so basically we got we got an organic source of rice grown cordyceps, cordyceps. yep but the sinensis which is the variety you want mm. which jam packs all the qualities of the energy giving I was going issues. to say changa and cordyceps because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is you know we've talked about you mentioned lion's mane reishi turkey tail changa cordyceps what what do, what, what do they do, for want of a better word, for, for we, the human? What are they good for? Yes. Um, they all push their own little wheelbarrow and, uh, and their stars in their own way. Yes. 
uh, cordyceps is very much your energy giving mushroom. Yeah. Um, very much focused on your um, giving you a bit more vitality and a bit more spring in your step. Yeah. Um, without getting to the chemistry of it all, uh, I'll just. Yeah. You know, otherwise, we could be here for, for, for days. For hours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, I, I've got um, uh, one of the hockey roos on our cordyceps. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I did a podcast with her. Yeah. And she, um, and she takes it and she's got friends of hers who are uh, top athletes on cordyceps. Yep. Um, good also for a, your immune system. Very good at boosting your immune system, as are most of the mushrooms. Yes. Um, chaga. Yep. Highly antioxidant mushroom. Good just for your overall body. You know, just, just uh, antioxidants. One of those keywords you see in, in green plants, yeah, um, and uh, and other things you see advertised, um, like goji berries and things like this. Mm. You know, antioxidants. One of those words. Right. Uh, Chaga is jam packed with that. Uh, right. Good cardiovascular health and things like this. Right. Mm. What else we got? We have got straight shiitake. Is the range here? Yeah. Um, turkey tail. Let's go turkey tail. Yes. Um, it's supposed to be very good with cancer, isn't it? Cancer. Um, one of the unfortunate things about what I do is that I come across a lot of very sick people. Yes. Who um, are desperate, uh, to put it in one way, is to, to find something to counteract or at least get them off chemotherapy and radiation mm. for cancer. Um, some people just get knocked for six with those treatments. Um, Turkey tail has, has got proven records uh, you can read any amount of scientific papers, which I do, do which yeah. is um, predominantly boring for most people, but for me, very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, cancer, um, again, immune system boosting. Yeah. Um, turkey tail is one I recommend for people who come to me with all sorts of issues. But I tend to modulate the level of dosage depending on where they are, because there's been um, very successful um, we, people being retrieved from very sticky situations like stage four cancers, yeah, things like this. Um, so we might even up the dose by like six times, yeah, depending on people's situation. But turkey tail is the one I go for, yeah, with that. Um, chaga, we've discussed. Uh, we've got a six blend mix up there too, which is all our mushrooms in one jar, yeah. So if you just want to have this lovely, uh, mushroom boost on a daily basis yeah we go the six mushroom blend which is very popular yeah because some people can't really figure out which one they want because they're all doing different things yeah so you take the six blend every day yes i'm getting a bit of a help everywhere you know yes. and personally i take six blend yeah every day and lion's mane yes every day Ta now for the listeners i've been taking lion's mane in a tincture format for about four to five months. And we discussed briefly when I first met you this morning. If if I was to say that it's increased my IQ by 10 or 20, most people would think, oh yeah. But the speed at which my brain works at is phenomenal. My eyesight's super clear. And, and just the ability to concentrate. I mean, I have a reasonable concentration span, um, but I can just maintain it throughout the entire day. My fiance has reported the same thing. And as I told you earlier on, my mother and father are, are reporting the same thing because I've got the same. In fact, my mother's, yeah, suffering with the irritability of being able to think quicker than her friends at the moment, more than anything else. Tell us a bit more about lines, mate. Fascinating mushroom. Mm. I've got some in the growing room. I can show you growing. Uh, I put them in the growing room to slow them up because they would have been picked before you got here. Yeah. So I, I, I've put these, they're chilled right down to two degrees. Otherwise you wouldn't have seen them. Yeah. <laughs> they would have been gone. Uh, lion's mane, I, I don't know if you know what they look like. They, they have like this, well, they have like almost like a mane, yes. hair, frond type. Yeah. They're, they're like a, a big shaggy ball of wool, you might say. Yeah. And they can grow to around about, you know, twice the size, three times the size of a cricket ball. 
and um, and um, to, you can eat them um, as a as a raw mushroom and cook them up in a bit of butter, and they just taste like abalone or fish, yeah, or crayfish. Chefs love them, yeah, but I won't grow them for fresh market because they're just too perishable. Yes. Uh, though I get phone calls every week say, can you supply me with lion's mane? Oh, I could do, but I'm not going to. Yes. You know, because it's just too hard to market. Yes. All ours goes to powder, you know. Um, lion's mane, um, Heresium erinaceus or Heresium coloroides are the two varieties that we have available to us. Very closely related. Um, both have got the beneficial compounds in them. Yeah. If correctly process like I mentioned before yes um, just to eat one you get some benefits but as I say it needs to be extracted to get the benefits um, fascinating mushroom not necessarily hard to grow yeah but hard to get ready to grow right so you need to do your lab work pretty precisely to get mm. it right but they grow and fruit quite quickly uh, amazingly quickly if you get everything right but like yes. anything in the mushroom world, you get it wrong and nothing happens. Yeah. Nothing happens. No. Um, so you get an immediate result there. Yeah. Um, but what you're saying is a common story I hear. I have, I have people say, I'm on your lion's mane. I've only been on it five days. Yes. And I feel alert, uh, clearer. I've lost that fogginess. Yep. I'm now recalling names. Yep. Because it coats your neurotransmitters with a mighty old sheath yes. and protects your brain cells and has been linked to repairing dead brain cells. Yes. Uh, it's, every, it's on everybody's lips now, you know. Um, crikey's, I need some lines, mate. And dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, you know, yes. hideous diseases to get when you're older. Um, why not make this part of your daily routine? Mm. A, a, a little drop or a powder on your yes. cereal or on a bit of yogurt or your tinctures dropped into your coffee yep whatever you want to do with it on a daily basis just to make sure that when you get to 80 or 90 you can still play scrabble right yeah <laughs> and hold your own and hold your own Indeed. i think it's it's just it's a it's a it's a small cost yes to get into old age and still have your marbles you might say yeah um so i i we take that the whole family takes it yep all right mandated <laughs> just you know, and, and it's processed properly. Yes. Okay. Um, maitake. Yep. Again, another one that's been listed to help with the issues of chemotherapy. You know, the, the outcomes of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, bad news. Uh, the, you know. um, but uh, immune system boosting, again. Um, uh, cardiovascular health. <clears throat> and also, you know, like your joint pain and things like this. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, things like mm. this, linked to all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, reishi. Um, reishi is a lovely mushroom for, um, again, another bracket fungus, very hard mushroom. It needs to be broken up and powdered because you, it's bitter as hell. Yeah. And generally, the, the, the more bitter these mushrooms are, the better they are. Yeah. Uh, because, from a medicinal perspective. Yeah, yeah, certainly not from the palate perspective. Yeah. Um, because uh, that's the triterpenes being released during the <clears throat> alcohol extraction. Mm. And without that, you won't get them. You won't get the benefit. They'll just go straight through and out again. Yeah. Again, you've got to be careful what you're buying and where you're buying it from to make sure you're getting it processed correctly. Yes. Um, but reishi is a good one to have five or six o'clock in the evening. Good for sleeping relaxing, calming, people with ADHD, things like that. Yep. Um, again, Lion's Mane's very good at that as well. Yes. Um, I've had, I had one guy the other day come up to me, he says, um, I've got ADHD, I've had it since I was five. And I've been on Ritalin all my life. Well, that's fair enough. Everybody sort of gets diagnosed with that, is given that. Yeah. Because there's not many alternatives, as far as I can see. Hmm. It's not my area. But they say, um, this particular chap said, I had your lines, mate. I've been on it a month. I recognised him I, I, from the markets. I sold it in the markets to him. And he said, I've been on this Ritalin, uh, on this uh, lines, mate, for a month. I've dropped my Ritalin without any side effects. Wow. I said, how do you feel? He says, I feel so good. 
I feel so alert. I feel calmer, mm. like the Rishi does. And I feel like um, I've just turned around. What's more, he says, my son's just been diagnosed with ADHD D2. Yeah. And he's not going on Ridley. He's going. He's going straight into Lions, mate. I'll get a report back in a month or two and see how he's going. Mm. To me, that's what makes that's what makes me get up in the morning. Yeah. Is that we've got mushrooms now. Rather than, as I say earlier on, filling people's bellies with mushrooms, yeah. I'm now producing mushrooms because of 45 years in the business, I'm, I think like a mushroom, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I just feel I feel better about the whole thing. Yeah. It's a my it's a new lease of life in in the my, mycological world for me. Yeah. Um, I can produce mushrooms that can um, just make people feel better, and maybe even maybe maybe even cure them. Yes. From things. Mm. But we don't guarantee. <laughs> Are there any other mushrooms that you don't supply at the moment that you'd like to get get into? Um, there is other varieties. Um, but I think I've got the main range here. Now. Yes. But every, it's on everybody's lips, is this yes. range here. Uh, I think my next focus is to go bushward. And find what? I'm looking for mushrooms. That are not on everyone's lips at that the moment. no one's got. Yeah. Uh, and then work with some very, very clever people and just get them totally analysed with an inch of their life to see whether we can, we can combat other issues that humans can get. That's where I'm coming from. So now it's it's more time with boots on, going out, walking, looking, exploring. Walking, looking. Yeah, yeah. Get them to a stage where I can actually isolate the clone, grow it out on a petri dish, because not everything grows from a petri dish. It'll only grow in naturally in the bush, yeah. uh, because that's where it's happy. You bring it into a lab, and a mushroom, you think, oh, crikeys, I'm not real fussed about this. You yeah. know, I'm not going to grow for you, mate. Sorry. Uh, but the ones that do grow, mm. I get a petri dish, and then from that petri dish, I can literally make, you know, kilos of spawn. And from a piece of mushroom, just taken from the centre of the, of the mushroom, just the the flesh, from underneath the cap or the stalk, I can start with a piece of mushroom that's the size of a grain of rice, and grow millions of kilos of mushrooms from that. Mm. Because I can make one kilo of spawn, which will make ten kilos, which will make a hundred kilos, which will make a thousand kilos, and from that I can make thousands and thousands of kilos of mushrooms. Wow! Uh, and that's how it exponentially just grows. Um, um, we need to find mushrooms that can. I believe mushrooms have got in their power the way they grow and the way they extract from nature. Minute chemicals mm. that we're not going to be able to create yes. in the lab. And that's probably my next 10 years to do that. It's very exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's too, it is. Yeah. Why do you think, like you mentioned earlier on, th these are the mushrooms that are now on everybody's lips. Why do you think it's now that people are becoming more open to, oh, what are the medicinal natures of mushrooms? It's the swing from chemical based mm. products that you can buy in the shop. We all know that the better it looks in the shop, there's probably the, a really good reason not to eat it. Yes. Because you try and grow veggies, you can't grow perfect veggies. Because <coughs> generally in the, in, the, yeah. in your own veggie patch, you don't walk around with spray cans, right? Yeah. So there's holes in it and this and that and that. Okay, well that's what happens in nature. Yes. You go there, see these polished apples and these broccoli that are absolutely colour, they come out of a mould. Yeah. I get immediately suspicious about the whole thing. And people are just thinking, they're linking that to what's good for you. And now people have got so much time and so much access to the internet and so much access to what is the Encyclopedia Britannica called an iPad. Yes, yes. Right? It's all in there. You can just dial up everything and it, up it comes with mushrooms and they start reading. That's the interest. Yeah because they're realizing their mushrooms now can be produced like we do with the facilities naturally. Mm. And then we've got the testing facilities where to analyze what's in them, that's yeah. good, and know how to extract those compounds organically mm. for your good health, a lot of interest. Mm. And so many people are worried about, you know, um, I mean, people, people want us to produce 
coffee-based mushroom powders, hmm. which you know we're going to do because I don't think anybody's going to give up coffee no matter what happens. Yeah. So people like their coffee, not only happy coffee, but also to be good for them. So why not have a shot of lion's mane in it, a shot of reishi, a yeah. shot of turkey tail, or even a shot of our six mushroom blend hmm. daily in their coffee, and they're going to feel good about it. Yeah. And if we get our doses right for all that sort of thing, you will feel good about it. Yeah. Because it's all in there, and you're just taking it along with your favourite drink of the day. Yeah. That's another thing we're working on. My daughter's the coffee. Uh, both of my daughters are into their coffees. Yeah. So basically, I've left that to them to experiment with. Yep. I'll stay with the, the science side of it. I'll, mm. I'll give you the product. You work out the drinks. You know? Yes. Um, I think that's the thing. Is everybody now so so switched on to what's good for them? Mm. And mushrooms have just risen out of the heap to the top and say, yeah. so little is known about them. And as I, when I started, you know, 45 years ago, there was nothing known about them. Yeah, yeah. Go to France, isn't it? <laughs> Go to France. Well, no. Um, and so I've come right up through the ranks. And I've mm. been thinking like a mushroom for 45 years, which is really unfortunate. What does that really. mean? I think, uh, well, uh, people ask you, um, how do you think like a mushroom? Well, I can walk into a growing room and I can sense there's something wrong. I know there's something wrong. Yes. It's nose, it's feel, it's look. You get that extra sense about yeah. what's going because you're thinking about what the mushroom requires and it doesn't feel right. And yeah. you can, because you've been doing it such a long time, you can zero in on that issue. And I guess that's me thinking like a mushroom. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, you walk in the forest and you find a mushroom growing. You think, oh, crikey, that one is growing in this environment on that type of wood, that particular tree type. Yes. This type of year. I don't know, you start thinking like a mushroom. You just do. And there's no other way. And you can't... So look at all the variables. And... Yeah, and you can't... You can't teach that to anybody in a no. rush you just need to be doing it for years mm. like anybody who specializes they make everything look simple don't they i mean someone who's very good at what they do yeah a golfer indeed yeah uh, whatever it might be you know blimey, I mean, how do you hit that shot every day like that is oh done it a few times been doing it a while you know yeah a bit like me really. this isn't my first rodeo <laughs> <laughs> what have you learned about yourself through all this I'm um, I'm a Virgo. Right. <laughs> Might say something. I'm a Virgo. I like everything to be right. Yes. It's got to be in place. It's got to be accounted for. It's got to be tidy. Yeah. And there's got to be a result. Yep. Um, and uh, and I don't think I don't like things that's uh, unexplained to me. So the quest hmm. for finding the result or um, just being super fussy. Super fussy. Super fussy. You can't, you've got to have patience. Yep. A lot of patience to be a mushroom grower. Because uh, if you didn't have patience, uh, you wouldn't last a month on a mm. mushroom farm. And I've got patience. And, and I, I just work through it. If someone else is, you know, throwing the spanner at the workshop wall, I say, I can't do this. I'm picking the spanner up and I'm going to go and try and fix it. Hmm. That's me. Yeah. I need to know how to get to the end result. Yeah. So I think I'm just one of those types. One of those types. A Virgo. Well, at least you put it to good. <laughs> well, I hope I am, yeah. 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 Um, the last question I ask all my guests, and this will be interesting, is um, it's a hypothetical question. And it's basically, if you could upload one question into almost like the collective consciousness. So everybody just sat still for five or 10 minutes and thought, thought about that question. What would it be? That's a curly one for the end, isn't it? <laughs> what would that question be? Yes. A question to ask other people. Yeah, that everyone would consider. Oh. Okay, well, this is another podcast, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got to have more time for each other. 
Right. I think we are just scrambling over each other to get through life in the best way we can. Um, and it's ugly. It's ugly in politics. It's ugly in power. It's ugly in money. Uh, and and we basically we're running out of patience with each other. I believe, mm. and, and we need to be able to slow up the world a bit mm. to where we've got time for each other. Mm. Um, so uh, I guess that's where I come in with the mushrooms. I like the idea of I that I can say. help people. Yeah. Um, and and uh, try your reishi. That'll help. Yeah, that'll chill you out. Um, I think that's the problem. I find there's people who's just so grumpy and short-tempered, and and there's and in fact, and there's too many of us. Mm. That's another issue. Um, you can't see that being addressed s soon, um, but I just feel that we are we're generally um, a bit aggro. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It seems like years gone by. We had a bit more time. It was a bit more relaxed. Yeah. But the pressures these days. Uh, don't compute with me at all. Mm. I think we should. I, I think because I've led more or less a rural life with doing this, but then again, I've run big business. Um, but that was always at my own pace. Mm. But it was always a learning curve. So I slowed up. And I had to slow up to learn what I was doing. Mm. And Otherwise, I think you wouldn't have learned what you've learned to you produce. You would not. Mm. You would not learn. Yeah. And I think that's what we're, we're all missing out on that. The fact that we're all just moving a bit too fast. There's a deep. Um, there's a deep sense of wisdom in that, is isn't it? there? Which is mirrored in the mushrooms. Mm. Maybe you're right. Mm. I, I, yeah. Well, I, 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 this, I'll be doing this until I just don't want to do it, and I can't see that anywhere soon. Right. I've got. Or the until the mushrooms start growing on you. I've got the next <laughs> generation coming up that takes my place. Yep. With this business. So, um, you know, my two, two daughters were born on a mushroom farm. That's all they know. Yeah. They were born on a mushroom farm. They think like a mushroom. They're, they think like mushrooms, yeah, and, um, and they eat their fair share of mushrooms, and they're on these powders too. Mm. They know what we're about. So they're all tuned in to what we're doing. And um, so we're not going to run out. Yep. Um, and... Uh, uh, that even though they're not Virgos, I've trained them to be super fussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Graham, it's been an absolute pleasure to talking to you today. Absolutely fascinating. Okay. If people want to find you, where do they find the products? Um, basically online. Um, yeah. Most of our work's online, so you know, uh, Touchwood Mushrooms, up it comes on the internet. Yep. And you can buy online, and we ship all around Australia. In fact, the world, if you want. We've sent them to Dubai and wherever uh, online, and um, and I'm always there to have a chat. People have got issues with health. Um, I'm always available to just talk over their issues. Yep. Um, so that's a service we provide as well. Um, but uh, yep, yeah, uh, as I say, here we are growing mushrooms. And who would have thought that? Um, 45 years from seeing a guy growing mushrooms in his back shed yes would result in growing having the biggest mushroom farm in the in in western australia the most high-tech farm probably in the world and then concentrating on medicinals for good health yeah. that's been my journey bonk isn't it just where i ended up yeah <laughs> yeah i can thank that farmer or maybe i can't thank him i don't know yeah I can thank that farmer for um, having those few mushrooms growing in his back shed. Yeah. Thanks very much. Because <laughs> he let me here. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>